This is week six of our Just Jesus series. I've shared with you that this series is an open-ended series. We're going to go all the way through the entire New Testament, and we're going to just see how long it takes us to do that. Normally, we do a four-part or a six-part series. This could be a 193-part series. I don't know how long it's going to take. But it was inspired by Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. We've got that up on the screen. Would you read this aloud with me, please? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what God led me to uh, back towards the end of last year. That was the inspiration behind this whole series to really talk about how Jesus shows up on every single page of the Bible. Old Testament and New, we see all kinds of foreshadowing of who Jesus is and what Jesus is going to do. So, so far we've, gonna, we've done a broad overview of the entire New Testament, and then we kind of zoomed in a little bit closer on the Gospels, and then we started to talk about Matthew specifically. So we talked about the first half of Matthew in kind of a broad overview, and then we did the second half of Matthew in a broad overview, and then we started digging in right at chapter 1, Verse 1. So then last week, uh, we took on Matthew 1, 1 through 4, which is the beginnings of Matthew's genealogy or genesis of Jesus. He's telling about the beginning of the human side of who Jesus is, how his earthly life came about. And again, we said Matthew's gospel has three big ideas that he wants to be sure we get all the way through. He hits on these three cylinders all the time. Number one is that Jesus is the promised Messiah. In the line of David, he's an ancestor of Abraham. He is the one everybody's been waiting for, watching for. That's a big part of what Matthew wants us to know. Second, Jesus is the new Moses. He's Moses' successor. In fact, we talked about how Matthew designated five key sections of his gospel to sort of mirror the five books of the Torah, five mini biographies of Jesus, each concluding with a significant section of teaching by Jesus. He's the new mouthpiece of God, the new authoritative prophet. He's the new teacher of the law. In fact, he's even greater than Moses. That's a big part Matthew wants us to remember. Third, that Jesus is God. He wants us to know that. In fact, known by the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's a big part of what Matthew's crux of his message is about as well. And remember, we said Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience who are very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, and so he quotes the Old Testament very frequently. As we're reading through the genealogy, last week we said, you know, what most of us do when we encounter a genealogy is we just kind of glaze over and we skim through it really fast. It's like the most boring parts of the Bible, right? So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so... All right, we're just bored by it. And so we skim over it. And we're like, okay, so what? Some people had babies who had babies who had babies. That's usual, right? That's the way all of life works. But if you know who these people were, then this brief lineage uh, is amazing to see. So Matthew's mentioning people who are the heroes of our faith, people who are worthy of being remembered, people who are honored and celebrated. So we're doing that. We're taking some extra time to make sure we know who all of these people Matthew you named are and why it is so extraordinary that Jesus comes from their lineage right now if you were astute last week you noticed Matthew kind of must have skipped a few generations along the way because at one point we're talking about Judah and his sons with Tamar and before you know it it looks like his grandsons were contemporaries of Moses who came along 430 years after Judah's death in Egypt, right? So we'll talk more later in the series about why Matthew maybe would have chosen to leave out certain generations in his genealogy. But for right now, I just want you to know you're not crazy. There was a huge gap of time in there. And that's because we want to remember the phrase the son of actually might be better understood as the descendant of. Of. Just because I say it's somebody's son, it might actually be their grandson or their great-grandson or their great-great-great-great-great-grandson. They're the descendant of someone. And Matthew is most concerned about showing us the royal lineage of Jesus rather than a very strict biological, chronological accounting of every single generation that came before. So last week we got all the way up to the first half of verse 5. And that's where we're going to pick up today. We're actually only going to do one verse today. And it's in Matthew 1, 5. Let's read it uh, aloud together. Would you read this with me? Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. 
walk. That's all we're going to talk about today. So like we said last week, if you don't know much about these people, that's pretty boring, right? Why is this important? I want you to see Matthew really says a mouthful in this one sentence, right? He tells this entire amazing story. In fact, this one sentence encompasses the entire book of Ruth and more. In a similar way, let's say you're a Harry Potter fan and you wanted to give the genealogy of the Potter family. You would say, James, the father of Harry by Lily, the father of James Sirius, Albus Severus, and Lily Luna by Ginny, and boom, in that one sentence, you've covered seven novels, plus an epilogue, and eight motion pictures of source material to fill out all the details of Harry Potter's life, right? And by the way, that's just a work of fiction. Spoiler alert, in case you weren't sure, right? Matthew, on the other hand, he's writing legit biblical history. He's writing about Jesus' own ancestral family. He's writing Jesus' true story. And this is huge for Matthew's original audience. We've already talked about Salmon and Rahab. Today, let's talk about their son, Boaz, and his wife, Ruth. Now, the first time Ruth, or Boaz, rather, appears in Scripture is here in the second chapter of Ruth. So if we're going to talk about Boaz, obviously we have to know who Ruth is first, because after all, the book is named after her. And Ruth's story begins in Ruth 1. We read that a descendant of Judah, a man named Elimelech, was married to a woman named Naomi. And this was during the time of the judges, the people who ruled Israel between the death of Joshua and the time that Saul became Israel's first king. And so around 1294 BC, there was a famine in Bethlehem. So Elimelech sold his land, took his wife and their two sons, Malon and Chilion, into the land of Moab. Where is Moab? Moab is southeast of Judah. And then we read that some point along the way, Elimelech died. His son Chilion had married a Moabite woman named Orpah. And his son Malon had named, married a Moabite woman named Ruth. And then these two sons of Naomi also died. Evidently, Moab living was rough on the dudes. Yeah, the women did all right. And so these three women, now all childless widows, were left alone in Moab. And so Naomi then received news that the famine back home had lifted, and she wanted to go back home to the homeland. And so she urged her two daughter-in-laws to return to their birth parents' homes to find new husbands and to go live their lives, to not worry about taking care of her. And she eventually convinces Orpah to do this, to leave her, but Ruth refuses to do so. And Ruth responds with an amazing statement of sacrificial love that I often refer to in wedding ceremonies. Because while Ruth was speaking to her mother in law, not her husband, the words that she speaks are such amazing words of unconditional love and commitment. And she speaks them in such a way it's so profound. And it actually demonstrates what Christian familial love should always be like. Look at Ruth 1 16 and 17 with me. Ruth replied, stop urging me to abandon you, for wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will become my people, and your God will become my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I do not keep my promise. Only death will be able to separate me from you. So let me just say, if you're not married yet, this is the kind of love you want your future spouse to express to you. Don't settle for anything less. If you are the child of a parent, an aging parent who needs you, this is the kind of love you should express to them as well. Don't you dare do anything less. This is certainly the kind of love and gratitude and commitment we should all express daily to Jesus. This is an amazing woman, this Ruth. She's someone all of us should aspire to be like. And as we read the rest of her story, we see that Ruth is actually a foreshadowing of the church, the bridegroom of Christ. So Ruth and Naomi, they move back to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And Ruth goes into the fields to glean whatever's left behind by the harvesters. What's gleaning? Gleaning is a legal provision given by God to help the poor 
and hungry of a community. And basically, the system is this. Whatever gets left behind on the ground after the first run-through by the harvesters, you know, they're putting stuff in bags and every once in a while they drop something, they're not allowed to go back and get it. They've got to leave it on the ground and they keep moving. And then the gleaners, the poor people, the hungry people, they come behind after and they're allowed to gather up whatever got left behind on the first uh, harvest uh, to help them out. Several years ago, Annette and I got to take our kids with us, and it was a great ministry project. We went out into a potato field, and we gleaned a whole bunch of potatoes. We spent the whole morning there just gleaning potatoes out of the dirt, and all those potatoes went to a nearby food bank. And it was a really humbling, really meaningful experience to go out and participate in that and to think about what if I were in the position where I had to go do this just to get enough potatoes to keep my family from starving, and so it was really a great opportunity to do a little bit of gleaning ourselves, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. So Ruth spends the whole morning out gleaning in this field, and she's working hard to provide enough food for her and Naomi. What well, turns out that this field is owned by Boaz, who sees her out in the fields, and he asks about her, and he learns that Ruth is a relative of Naomi, and therefore a relative of his. And we find out that Boaz was a close relative of Naomi's dead husband, Elimelech. And the Bible calls him a near kinsman, is the phrase it uses. Even though we learn there was at least one other man in Bethlehem who was an even nearer uh, uh, kinsman in relation to Elimelech and to his sons, right? And so this, he's also then a near kinsman to Ruth herself because she is uh, the widowed bride of one of Elimelech's sons. So Boaz approaches Ruth and he tells her, listen, you don't need to make the rounds of all the other fields. You can just stay working in my fields. And in fact, you don't have to wait to glean after the harvests. You can actually go out with the harvesters and, and pull things for you and Naomi at the same time. And you can keep whatever you can harvest. And he also promises her that he'll protect her from the male harvesters. Nobody's going to be able to abuse her or take advantage of her. He tells her to help herself to as much water as she likes throughout the day. And he reveals their kinship. She's stunned by his generosity. And she, she's like, why are you doing this? And that's when he reveals we're related, right? And he asks uh, here he tells her, oh, I'm so amazed at how wonderful you've been to your mother-in-law, Naomi. The way you've taken care of her, it's really an admirable thing. And he invites her to a roasted grain meal with them at midday. He tells his workers to leave extra grain for her to gather. And she gets to go home to Naomi with 30 pounds of grain and share this leftover lunch of roasted grain with Naomi. And Naomi is stunned. She's like, how is this possible from one day of gleaning leftovers in a field? And Ruth tells her about Boaz, to which Naomi replies, ah, this man is a close relative of ours. He is one of our guardian redeemers. In the original Hebrew, this term guardian redeemer, also known as a kinsman redeemer, is the Hebrew ga'al. Ga'al. This is what she's talking about. In God's law, Boaz, a close relative, has both the moral and the legal obligation to serve as a guardian of the family's interests. And this includes the responsibility of caring for the widows of his deceased kinsman, Elimelech, and his two sons. And of all the fields Ruth could have selected to work in that day, what do you think? Do you think it was an accident? Do you think it was a coincidence that she chose the field of Boaz? Turn to your neighbor and say, no way, Jose. By the way, if someone just said that to you and your name actually is Jose, isn't your mind blown just a little bit right now? That's not a coincidence either. Jose, can you see? So back to Boaz and Ruth. Ruth keeps working for Boaz throughout the harvest, and then one day Naomi decides she's going to play matchmaker. The Bible doesn't say specifically, but Jewish tradition says Ruth is about 40 years old at this time, while Boaz is about 80 years old at this time. I thought I robbed the cradle with a net. She's six years younger than me. Right? Naomi tells Ruth, here's what you do. You bathe, you get dressed up, you put on perfume, and then you go to Boaz while he's asleep, Uncover his feet, lie down beside of him at his feet. And so Ruth does this. And Boaz wakes up and he sees her. And he doesn't recognize her first. So who is that? She tells him who it is. And she says, you're my kinsman, redeemer. Cover me with the corner of your garment. 
And the word in Hebrew here also means wings. So Ruth is essentially asking Boaz, protect me like a bird protects her young under its wings. That's, that's the word picture, the metaphor here. And I'm always reminded of Psalm 17, 8 when I think about this event. Ruth's great-grandson David would one day write the words, keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. And so by asking him to cover her with the corner of his garment, Ruth is essentially asking Boaz, take me as your wife, protect me, for in your protection I will find God's provision and protection as well. And I know this sounds a little weird to our modern practices, right? But this was essentially a marriage proposal from Ruth to Boaz. And sure, it's a little different than using a jumbotron at the ball game, right? <laughs> but it's still effective. Boaz says he's touched that Ruth has not run after the younger, more virile men. He's instead, but she's instead chosen him as her redeemer, as her husband. He says, though, there's actually one other relative of ours who's even closer in relation to you than me. And the law requires that he first be given the opportunity to become the kinsman redeemer of your family. But if he refuses, I'll be happy to do so. But by law, I have to give him the right first. So you might remember from last week the story of Judah and Ur and Onan and Tamar last week. And remember we said in that culture there was this legal requirement to marry, to care for the widow of a close relative, and to produce an heir for her dead husband if he had none, right? So remember, if I marry my kinsman's childless widow, the first son born to her is technically the heir of her first husband, not my own heir. He will carry on that man's name, not mine. He retains all the property of his mother's first husband. It does not belong to me or any of my other descendants. That's the law. And we also learn in the book of Ruth that this was a, a property involved that was originally owned by Elimelech that needed to be redeemed. To be returned to the possession of the family of Naomi. And here's some context for understanding that. At that time when land was sold in Israel, it was more like a lease or a rental agreement. Because all land reverted to the original owners automatically whenever a year of Jubilee came about. The 50th year. Even if I sold you this land 50 years later, it's my land again. All debts get erased. All uh, original property gets returned to their owners. But in between these years of Jubilee, even if I had technically sold the land, that original owner and his family, they still possessed the title to that land and they could buy it back early or they could redeem it at any time during this space of time between the years of Jubilee. So we know Elimelech had sold his land in this time of hardship during this famine that drove him and his family to Moab. However, that land was still redeemable by Elimelech's family if they would pay off the balance of the lease to whoever the current occupant was. Normally, title of land would normally have passed on to Elimelech's sons and then on down through the line to the nearest of kin, but they'd all died. And so technically, the land reverted to Naomi and could be purchased or redeemed by a near relative male who then had to also take care of Naomi, and in this case, she, he would have to take care of Ruth as well. As per the law, he had to do his best to give this woman of childbearing years a son who would become the eventual heir of the property, again, would not be considered his own heir, but the heir of the deceased kinsman whom, uh, whose wife he had redeemed. So that's the big picture. So Moses, or Boaz, not Moses, Boaz goes and meets with this other closer kinsman. And he lays all this out for him. Here's Ruth, here's Naomi, Elimelech, our kinsman. Here's the situation. Will you redeem them? And this other kinsman, he realizes that in buying the land, he's actually just giving the land to the heirs of Elimelech, and thereby he's losing the land itself, as well as the money he has to use to purchase it back. And he has to spend all this money to take care of Ruth and Naomi for the rest of their lives. And so as he weighs that all out, he says, ah, I see that as ruining my own inheritance. I'm not interested. I defer to you. Even though I'm the nearer kinsman, I'll let you do it. So Boaz meets with him in front of these elders. And we learn Boaz is definitely willing to do all of this, buy the land, return it to Naomi, give her some income from being able to farm it now, allow her to live on it the rest of her life. And so Boaz does this, realizing the land technically still belongs to Elimelech's and Malon's 
descendants of which uh, his child and Ruth, their child, would be one of those descendants. And so since this other relative's declines, Boaz has obeyed the law completely. Boaz marries Ruth, redeems the land, redeems Ruth, redeems Naomi in the process. Okay, so that's the big picture. So let's look at Ruth 4, verses 11 and 12. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. Remember them from last week? Who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Though the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah. Do you see how all of Matthew's genealogy of Jesus is not just this long, boring list of names? It's rooted in real history. Those are all names we dug deep into last week. Rachel, Leah, Israel, Perez, Tamar, Judah. Look at God's one story of redemption as it continues now through the union of Boaz and Ruth. And Ruth gives birth to a son whom they name Obed, and now both Naomi and Ruth, who were both previously rendered childless, now they have a son, they have a descendant, a grandson in Naomi's case, a legal heir to the family name, someone to carry on the name of Elimelech. And the other women of Bethlehem bless Naomi when they hear the news. Look at Ruth 4, 14. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer may he become famous throughout israel he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth and then naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him the women living there said naomi has a son and they named him obed and then the book of Ruth concludes with a genealogy that is almost verbatim repeated in Matthew's genealogy. And we said this a little bit last week that Matthew clearly copied this from the Old Testament. And then he added in the names of some of the other women as we discussed last week. Now, next week we're going to move on to Obed a little bit more. Obed's son Jesse and Jesse's son David next week. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what this has to do with with Jesus. Because remember, the series is called Just Jesus, right? So you remember I told you Jesus shows up in some way in every book of the Old Testament, almost on every single page in some way. So we want to recap the history that we just talked about, but let's look specifically for how this points to Jesus as we do so. Here's the takeaway. Here's kind of my closing thoughts for the day. We've got an example of Boaz as a kinsman redeemer, a guardian redeemer. Boaz is a Jew descended from Judah, born in Bethlehem, great grandfather of King David. And Boaz sends workers into his fields to plant and to grow and to harvest. He receives a Gentile, Ruth, when she comes into his fields to glean while his workers are harvesting. And as an upstanding man, Boaz obeys the law that requires him to be a kinsman redeemer of his relative's family. He follows the law to the letter. He gives the right of first refusal to a closer relative. When they refuse, Boaz ultimately becomes the kinsman redeemer of both Jew and Gentile, Jewish Naomi and Moabite Ruth, by purchasing the land of Elimelech, redeeming the lost inheritance of Naomi and Ruth, thus gaining the right to make Ruth his bride. That's Boaz, right? Now consider Jesus, who also is a Jew, who also descended from Judah, who also was born in Bethlehem, who is a descendant of Boaz. And like his ancestor Boaz, Jesus sends his laborers into the fields to work, to plant seeds, to spread the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, and to help bring about the harvest of eternal souls into the new kingdom of God that he proclaims throughout the gospel. Like Boaz, Jesus treats his own people, the Jews, well. And like Boaz, he also receives, welcomes, redeems both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus, like Boaz, keeps the Mosaic law. He does what's right. Even more so than Boaz, Jesus 
is a perfect man without any sin of his own. And because of this, we could consider him wealthy in righteousness, just as Boaz was wealthy in land and uh, finances. Jesus is wealthy in righteousness, and therefore he is able to pay off all of our debts to redeem back everything that we lost in the fall in the Garden of Eden, right? And Jesus does this. He buys off. He pays off all our sin debts, Jew and Gentile alike, redeeming us from sin if we accept him for who he is and what he offers to us. And in doing so, Jesus therefore gains the right to make us, the church, his bride. Remember how Boaz would not, and in a very legal, real sense, he could not, Redeem Ruth and Naomi until he had obeyed the full demands of the law of the Lord to offer the right to another before taking Ruth as his bride and providing a son for her husband's line and name. Think about Jesus again. Jesus, in order to redeem us, had to first fully obey all of the law's demands, all of the legal demands within the law. He had to live a perfect life without sin before he could have the opportunity to redeem us. Like Boaz was for Ruth, Jesus is our guardian redeemer, our kinsman redeemer. He came to pay off a debt that we could never pay off ourselves. He came to purchase back our inheritance that we lost when sin entered humanity. He came to buy us back into God's family. And for Jesus, the price he paid was his own blood. His own perfect, sinless life was shed for you and for me. That's what Paul's writing about in Galatians 3. He says, Christ redeemed us. There's that word, guardian, redeemer, kinsman, redeemer. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And then Paul makes this kinsman-redeemer connection even more clear in Galatians 4. He says, but when the appropriate time or the appointed time had come, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we may be adopted as sons with full rights. So do you see that connection? Knowing that. We see this obvious, beautiful foreshadowing of the redemptive acts of Jesus in the history of Boaz and Ruth, don't we? They give birth to a son. Remember, legally, the son is now the son of another man. But Boaz also adopts him as his own as well. He provides for him. He cares for him. And, and just as God adopts us as his own and provides for us. And as I said, Boaz and Ruth name their son Obed. And the work of Obed, the descendants produced by Obed, eventually lead us to Jesus. By the way, Obed in Hebrew means a servant or a workman. And what does the union of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, and his bride, the church, produce? Servants. Workers for God, Obeds, if you will. Shortly after Matthew's call to follow Jesus, he also records these words by Jesus to his disciples. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest ready fields. The Greek word Matthew uses here for worker is eragates, which specifically refers to a field laborer, a laborer in general, a workman in general. And so like the union of Boaz and Ruth, the union of Jesus and his church both produce obeds or eragates, right? Workers in his fields. And that eventually leads others to Jesus, leads others to their redemption as sons of God as well. And that's where we're going to pause in our study of Matthew today. Last week we covered four verses. This week we just covered one. Do you see how rich, how rooted in the Old Testament Matthew's presentation of the gospel of Jesus is? is even in these early verses, the genealogy of Jesus. And do you see how important it is knowing our Hebrew roots, right? Matthew's audience, they knew their Hebrew roots. They were Hebrew, right? We've got to know our Hebrew roots if we're going to understand fully who Jesus is, what Jesus did for us, when he did it, how he did it, why he did it, where he did it. We've got to have our Hebrew roots if we're really going to get the big picture of what's being presented to us in the scriptures. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you so much for this wonderful truth that we celebrate today. That even though Jesus died 
on the cross. He did not stay there. He rose from the dead. My Savior lives. And because of his death, he redeemed me from sin. He redeems us all from sin if we just receive this gift that he offers freely to us. To confess that we are in need of redemption. That we do need our sins to be forgiven. And that this gift has been offered freely to us. And all we have to do is say, Jesus, I have confidence that you are who you say you are. That you'll do everything that you promise to do. I put my trust, I put my faith in you as my guardian redeemer, as my kinsman redeemer, as my Lord, as my Savior. You lead. I'll follow you. Jesus, change my life from the inside out. You lead the way, and I'll follow you. I am fully devoted to following you, my God, my King, my Savior. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you can just say, me too, God. Me too. That's what I want. Jesus, be my Redeemer. That's my prayer for all of us today in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen.